evening. Buenas tardes. <laughs> First, I would like to thank the rector, Professor Henning Jensen, for the introduction. I feel very honored to have been invited to deliver the inaugural lecture for this academic year here at the University of Costa Rica. I thank Professor Montserrat Sagor for contacting me and for all of her work in enabling this event. This is the first time I have visited Costa Rica. And I'm very happy to have arrived in the immediate aftermath of your national elections. <laughs> I was warned beforehand that you would be experiencing either a very deep depression <laughs> or collective joy. <laughs> and so I say congratulations, congratulations. Feminista por América Latina. <laughs> and of course, and of course, I am especially excited that here in Costa Rica you have elected the very first black woman vice president in all of Latin America. Congratulations, Vice President-elect Epsi Campbell. <laughs> I have been asked to speak this evening on the topic of feminism and social transformation in the Trump era. <laughs> First of all, I should say, that we are working toward the possibility of a very brief Trump presidency and thus, to pre and thus to prevent what he represents, that is to say racism, misogyny, xenophobia, xenophobia, reactionary nationalism, militarism, etc., to prevent uh, these, um, these backward ideas from achieving the kind of hegemony in our country that he and his supporters would certainly like to see. We thus continually remind ourselves that Donald Trump did not receive the popular vote, that he was only elected thanks to the persistence of an obsolete institution linked to slavery, which is called the Electoral College. This institution was originally designed to guarantee political leverage for states with large slave populations but very small white populations as the ghosts of slavery continue to haunt us more than a century and a half after slavery's putative abolition, we can say that it was slavery indeed that enabled the election of Donald Trump. We might say that while the results of the last presidential election in the U.S. were devastating, especially considering the impact on immigrants from Mexico, Central America, 
but also from countries where Islam is a dominant religion. Moreover, the White House, with its ever-rotating personnel, is whiter and more male than it has been in many decades. The slogan embraced by Donald Trump, Make America Great Again, translates into pretend America is white and male again. And of course, we in the United States must take note that we live in the United States of America, which does not give us the right to colonize the entire hemisphere. <laughs> Although the results of the election a little more than a year ago, were certainly disheartening. We were fortunate that it coincided with a historical conjuncture characterized by an upsurge in organized resistance to racial violence, largely led by young, radical, and queer black women who have insisted on feminist approaches to social transformation. Women are indeed on the rise all over the world. Finally, it has taken long enough. It was not accidental that the immediate response to Trump's election was a massive march led by women in Washington and sister marches all over the country. Neither was it adventitious that women's marches took place all over the world last year and this year, including, I understand, here in San Jose, Costa Rica. As I mentioned the election of Epsi Campbell as evidence that women are indeed on the rise, I also feel compelled to, ev to evoke the Afro-Brazilian activist and elected official Marielle Franco Councilwoman, councilwoman, advocate for the poor, for targets of racist violence, for the LGBTQ community, for human rights more broadly. As you know, she was assassinated last month, and people around the world are paying tribute to her. After the coup which pushed out Dilma Rousseff and replaced her with the deeply conservative Michael Temer. It was said that black women's movements represented Brazil's progressive future. The assassination of Marielle Franco was clearly an attempt to thwart the further development of that movement that black women's movement in Brazil that has called for radical social transformation in every aspect. I speak about women on the rise, but let us not forget that in fact, women have always been the backbone of social justice movements, always. And of course, um, as the uh, rector pointed out, we are observing the 50th anniversary of the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King, um, April 4th, tomorrow. Uh, and it is also important to point out that 
uh, as essential as Dr. King's contributions were, we always tend to associate movements for racial justice with male figures, like Dr. King, Malcolm X, Huey Newton of the Black Panther Party. But in all three cases, the movements would not have existed without the pivotal contributions of women. The Black Panther Party is still known throughout the world, but rarely do people know that the majority of the members of the Black Panther Party were women. Yes. The pivotal event of the civil rights movement, the Montgomery bus boycott, uh, and Dr. King emerged as the spokesperson for that boycott. Uh, uh, that event would not have been successful without the participation of women, black women, poor women, women who were domestic servants, they were the people who refused to ride the bus and thus pushed the movement forward. But it is only now, more than a half century later, that we are recognizing how important it is to value women's leadership. For those who argued that feminism was obsolete as the icons of mainstream feminism grew older. They did not recognize that new waves of feminism had emerged and that the most vibrant forms of feminism today are not what we once called mainstream white bourgeois feminism. And we could also refer to mainstream white bourgeois feminism today. Uh, but rather what is currently referred to as intersectional feminism. It is not carceral feminism, a feminism that has learned to rely on the police and prisons to solve the problems of gender violence, but rather abolition feminism. Feminism that recognizes the interconnections between gender violence and racist violence, between intimate violence and institutional violence, between individual violence and structural violence. Since the advent of feminist studies within the academic sphere and the corresponding impact of feminism on movement organizing, new approaches have developed along with more elucidating vocabularies, more revealing analyses, and thanks to feminist scholars and organizers, we have begun to understand connections, relationalities, intersectionalities. If we fail to perceive connections, relations, intersections, crossings, junctures, coincidences, overlapping and cross-hatching phenomena, we will be forever imprisoned in a world that appears to be white and male and heterosexual and cisgender and capitalist and US centric or Eurocentric. We have learned from feminist studies that the world is not homogeneous that all the women are not white, that all the blacks are not men, that if we do not include racial justice and economic justice, then gender justice has not been achieved. It means that we have to develop habits of perception, habits of analysis that 
acknowledge the inadequacies of the conceptual tools on which we are compelled to rely. Not long ago uh, in the US, I asked an audience, a large audience such as this, uh, when women got the vote in the United States. And of course, without thinking, most responded because they know their feminist history, 1920. 1920 was a very important historical date. It was the date when white women got the right to vote. The majority of black women did not get the vote until 1965 with the passage of the Voting Rights Act. One woman cannot stand in for all women, especially if that one woman is white and affluent. Racial and economic hierarchies often prevent us from understanding how we can most effectively unite and move forward. One might pose this question, if one woman moves forward, but leaves everyone else behind, is this really a blow for women's equality? And I think about the US black women's club movement, um, whose slogan um, uh, during the 1920s or so was lifting as we climb, lifting as we climb. The upsurge in feminist inflected organizing that we are witnessing today is the result of many decades of struggle against racism within the labor movement, against misogyny for LGBTQ rights, against the prison industrial complex for environmental justice, for the rights of disabled people, against imperialism, solidarity with many struggles around the world, Latin America, South Africa, Palestine, Feminist theories and organizing approaches have helped us to understand the deep connections that link these struggles. Given the demagoguery emanating from our current government and the explicit exploitation of racism and xenophobia to persuade poor and working class white populations that their interests call for an attack on racialized communities, it is important to point out that the suffering of poor white and working class communities has been caused pretty much by the same economic phenomena that are responsible for the rise of mass incarceration and the prison industrial complex, and for the reasons that lead people from Central America, Mexico, elsewhere in the global south to migrate to other countries. The United States can claim 25% of all incarcerated people on the planet as compared to its 5% of the world's population. With respect to women, there are more women in prison in the US today than there were people of all genders in prison during the 1970s. Between 1980 and 2014, the number of incarcerated women increased by more than 700%, rising from a total of 26,000 a little more than 26,000 in 1980 to uh, more than 215,000 in 2014. 
I want to um, look for a moment at the conditions that um, led uh, to uh, these increases in the imprisoned population um, in the US and in other countries um, that led also to increased immigration and that led to the impoverishing, impoverishment of further impoverishment of poor and working class communities of all racial and ethnic backgrounds. So let's begin with the period of the 1980s, which marks what we know now as the last stage, the last instantiation of capitalism, um, a mode of production that has um, indeed become global. Capital has always had global aspirations, uh, and I should uh, uh, point out that capitalism is very much linked uh, to the global conditions produced by slavery. Uh, and uh, uh, as, um, as um, political scientist Cedric Robinson uh, has uh, insisted, capitalism should be referred to as racial capitalism. But of course, during this period, manufacturing begins to take place across national borders. Uh, and incidentally, we might note that this stage of capitalism has begun to reveal, further reveal, the obsolescence of the nation state as the most appropriate form of human community. Uh, we have witnessed over the last decades, capital flowing across national borders, information, commodities, knowledge, uh, everything moves easily across uh, the, the, the borders of the nation. Uh, but of course, when human beings join that flow, when human beings uh, begin to move, largely as a result of the consequences of the flow of capital, they are deemed illegal. And of course, all of this began to take place at a time when the welfare state was under assault, at a time of the ascendancy of international finance capital and its demands for structural adjustment, that is to say, demands to move capital away from sectors of the economy that serve the needs of the people. And we're referring to housing and healthcare and education, uh, et cetera. Away from sectors that serve the needs of the people and toward um, more profitable um, sectors of the economy. The point is, these are dangerous shifts away from investment in processes that reflect people's needs and toward the production of profit. And of course, this happened all over the world. Countries in, in the global south were especially affected by this. This was one of the impetuses along with war that have driven people to leave their homelands in, in search of a um, better life. But in the global north, of course, uh, uh, we witnessed the loss of jobs, deindustrialization, the production of surplus populations, especially among those who have always been vulnerable to job loss and the lack of resources. This is how racism works. Thus the spread of the prison industry, the emergence of the prison industrial complex. Uh, uh, and the repressive means of managing populations that can no longer find a place in the world as corporations migrated to other parts of the world in search of cheaper, cheap, cheaper labor sources, they disrupted local economies. And this was in part 
uh, this served in part as, 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 a, as an impetus for migration away from the homeland to places that appeared to represent hope. The point that I'm trying to make is that white economic suffering in the US is directly linked to black and Latino poverty and to the tendency to lock up people who have been defined as superfluous or irrelevant. Many years ago, a number of us began to organize against what we um, decided to refer to as the prison industrial complex. We did not know that our analysis would become even more important during the second decade of the 21st century with the election of a billionaire capitalist to office who presumes to want to reverse the very processes that allowed him to make his billions. We now recognize that that the election of Trump could have been avoided. And I don't have time to develop a critique of the Democratic Party. <laughs> but I will say that many of the same issues we are confronting today, um, would we would be confronting uh, even if a Democratic candidate had been elected, even if that candidate became the first woman, first white woman elected to the presidency in the US. This, this devastation could have been avoided had radical organizers devoted attention to those white communities that have seen their jobs and their lives slip away as a result of the rise of global capitalism. As a result of the assault on the labor movement and as a result of the continuing massive transfer of wealth to the already wealthy. We know that eight billionaires own as much as the poorest half of humanity. Today, it has been calculated that there are approximately 7.6 billion people in the world, half of which would amount to 3.8 billion. Now, eight people, including Mark Zuckerberg, Bill Gates, Jeff Bezos, uh, um, and we could continue, Warren Buffett, uh, Michael Bloomberg, and others. Uh, they own more than 3.8 billion people combined. Isn't that obscene? Why then can people be led so easily to believe that they are poor because immigrants cross the border from Mexico? The figure, the figure of the immigrant is an ideologically constructed scapegoat designed to deter poor and working class people in the US from, recognize, from recognizing how much they have in common with people who are fleeing difficult economic circumstances, often created by the very uh, corporations that have left people in the US bereft of employment. Why is feminism especially important to us now? Because feminist analyses help us to apprehend connections that are utterly denied in 
popular political discourse. Donald Trump announced today that he will send the military to guard the border with Mexico and those areas where he, he has been calling for a wall. In this, he is following the state of Israel, the militarization of the border. This is precisely designed to deflect attention from, from, a, from the deep kinship between immigrants searching for a better life in the US and people whose economic predicament has severely declined who would also like to have a better life and a better future. The importance of feminist approaches resides in the mandate to seek understanding of affinities and relations, especially in cases which appear to reveal disconnections and discontinuities. In the US and in many parts of the world, we are now intensely focused on sexual harassment and gender violence. And again, I would say, finally, gender violence is the most pandemic form of violence in the world. And we're just now witnessing a surge of popular opposition to these forms of violence. So let us ponder the important connections between the rising of women against sexual assault, sexual harassment, and the long history of black women contesting the deep links between sexual assault and racist institutions. Rape was an integral element of slavery. Racial dominance and sexual dominance mutually reinforced one another. The slave master was the sexual master as well. Today we tend to think of sexual assault and sexual harassment as flowing from a defective individual. So simply get rid of the men who are perpetrating gender violence, fire them from their jobs, send them to prison. Well, it's probably good that people like Harvey Weinstein have uh, you know, suffered some consequences. Um, but the point that I'm making is that only addressing the individual will not make the problem go away because the problem is deep, the problem is structural. Um, perhaps some of you followed the case of um, Larry Nasser, a doctor for the uh, US Olympic gymnastic team, who has sexually molested probably hundreds of young girls and young women. He was sentenced to prison for 175 years. Uh, uh, and that's kind of ridiculous because he's not going to be around for 175 years anyway. Uh, uh, uh. But that punishment forgets the real reasons why you know, such a devastating assault on young girls and, 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 and young women could occur over time. It forgets to look at the institutional context, the structural character of that, that, that violence. This is, of course, a very compelling argument for prison abolition. Uh, um, prisons uh, tend to serve as, um, as a strategy for forgetting, uh, for failing to address the real problems behind the reasons so many people are sent to prison, whether it's um, um, illiteracy or poverty or a whole range of 
other reasons, racism, or you know, whether it is harm, um, horrendous uh, violence inflicted by one individual on others. Um, as long as the institutional con context is left intact, the problem will continue, no matter how many men you get rid of. Uh, and I think this is the lesson we've learned from struggles against racism. That, that racism is not primarily a product of, 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 of uh, particular kinds of individualities. Uh, uh, and it seems that, um, that we should draw from the lessons we have learned about this, the, the, the structural and institutional production and reproduction of racism uh, uh, in, in order to move forward in our effort to uh, rid the, the world of, of gender violence. Within the United States, we've been focusing a great deal recently on gun violence. And you've been following uh, the, the young people who have so courageously uh, stood up against the National Rifle Association, am I right? These, these uh, beautiful, brave, eloquent uh, young people from the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in Parkland Avenue who are standing up to elected officials, who are showing us that the NRA can be challenged. Uh, and there are many young women in their ranks and among the spokespersons. Uh, and I mentioned the name of Emma Gonzalez uh, to give you an example. This, these students are, are not allowing us to forget that gun control should have been enacted decades ago, before the gun industry profited on the millions of guns they have sold. Um, is, it, is it believable that there are more guns owned by the civilian population in the United States than there are people. Um, but the question I'd like to pose this evening is why we treat gun violence as entirely separate from sexual violence. What greater example of what has come to be called toxic masculinity and we're talking about uh, uh, this ideologically uh, uh, produced um, toxicity of, 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 um, of a certain version of masculinity. So what greater example of toxic masculinity do we have than male figures with guns, uh, threatening military, retributions, uh, threatening to push immigrants um, across the border, threatening to push demonstrators uh, back with tanks and guns. What better symbol of noxious masculinity than that which needs to express itself by harassing or attacking women? Uh, with guns. Why is it so difficult to recognize these connections? Feminist approaches call for thinking things together that have been ideologically separated. How is it that we could have ever thought that it might be possible to achieve women's liberation while leaving behind indigenous women, Latina women, Muslim women, Asian American women, trans women. Why is it so difficult to recognize trans women as women? Even though, even though we know that gender, 
and especially the binary structure of gender, is totally constructed. Historically, to take an example from US history, black women were not recognized as real women because they were too outspoken, too angry, not submissive enough. Thus, the 19th century cult of true womanhood, true womanhood was white, true womanhood was middle class, etc. Not acknowledging the heterogeneity of gender, cisgender, transgender, gender fluid, gender nonconforming, etc., disarms us. It prevents us from contesting violences that ultimately affect all of us. Black trans women in the US, at least, are the most consistent targets of violence, of individual violence, of stranger violence, of intimate violence, partner violence, also institutional violence, state violence, police violence, prison violence. Radical feminist approaches allow us to understand that issues that might appear initially to be minor and marginal have major, central, vast implications. And I'm thinking about the vast implication of struggles around gender for the contemporary period. Um, and speaking about minor struggles with vast implications, let us think about what is happening today in occupied Palestine, uh, you know, particularly on the border with Gaza. Uh, and we in the US remember that it was Palestinian activists who initiated the global response to Ferguson the Ferguson protests that occurred in 2014, in August of 2014, uh, in the aftermath of the police killing of, of um, Michael Brown. Black Lives Matter. Black Lives Matter, yes. And speaking about seemingly minor issues having major implications. Uh, the, the, the meaning of the slogan, Black Lives Matter, is, uh, is this. Uh, when finally in the world, black lives are acknowledged as mattering, that will mean that all lives matter. Logically, logically, it is a way of moving toward the universal that is indeed more inclusive, that can indeed attend to the particular. It is not accidental that the very same groups um, that today call for solidarity with Palestine, recognize how important it is to emphasize women's leadership. And women's leadership, or we might say black women's leadership, referring to the movement for black lives, we might say black queer women's leadership, uh, is not about simply replacing men with women. It's not about substituting women for men while retaining a leadership paradigm that is masculinist, that is based on individual charisma, um, uh, that does not understand the importance of collective approaches to leadership. Therefore, we contest normative notions of leadership. 
normative notions of assimilation and inclusion because they most often require us to become that which was originally responsible for our marginalization and exclusion. Who needs to be included according to terms that will require us to replicate the structures that were responsible for exclusion in the first place? What is the point of endorsing race and gender diversity within a framework that remains racist and heteropatriarchal at its core? And I should perhaps say that um, in the US, um, um, in universities, uh, other institutions such as corporations, the main watchwords now are diversity and inclusion. Um, speaking of leadership, leadership is not intrinsically male. Leadership is not intrinsically based on the charismatic, individualistic, masculinist model, but rather can also be collective, can be feminist. This is a, an exciting moment in history. Increasing numbers of people are recognizing that the world must change. We are witnessing changing notions of gender, contestations of the gender binary. We are witnessing rising uh, movements uh, in immigrant populations. Indigenous people are demanding that the land and the environment be respected. Uh, uh, if we cannot join the, the movement for environmental justice, it makes no sense to call for an end to racism or an end to uh, misogyny as the planet uh, uh, begins, continues to be uh, destroyed. I believe and I've been accused of being an inveterate optimist, uh, but I believe that the Trump era will eventually only be a minor footnote. <laughs> An attempted but ultimately unsuccessful deviation from the path carved out by global struggles for freedom and democracy. And so I would like to conclude my presentation by evoking the words of Ella Baker, a mid 20th century freedom fighter uh, from the United States. Um, and she said, we who believe in freedom cannot rest until it comes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias.